Hello, everyone, and welcome. I want to thank y'all for joining us today. We are excited to bring you this training as part of the first ever Disaster Re Resilience Awareness Month. Throughout the month, month of March, Equal Justice Works is teaming up with different legal aid organizations who are collaborating with a diverse group of subject matter experts to spread awareness about disaster-related issues and share resources for disaster preparedness and recovery efforts. So for more information and to join us in spreading the awareness, you know, follow Equal Justice Works on Twitter and Facebook. The discussion today is brought to you by Disability Rights Texas and the American Red Cross to inform you about the services provided in a disaster. So if you have questions during the session, please do not hesitate to post them and we will answer them as we can. I have the pleasure of talking to some amazing and wonderful people from Red Cross. So first we have Sherry Myers. She's a disability integration coordinator. Then we have Karen Koski Miller. She's a program manager for disaster mental health. And Mary Casey Locklear, program manager for disaster health services. So let's start with the big picture. What does Red Cross do? Don't everybody jump at once. Um, I'll just I'll take it from the from the uh, disability integration perspective. Um, we our aim is to make certain that everyone is welcome in our shelters and other service delivery sites like food distribution and um, bulk distribution and that kind of thing. Um, we within our shelters have a number of ways to support people with disabilities. We, we do um, have our DI team goes out and assesses and surveys the, the facility, usually before a disaster, but sometimes not, depends on where we're told um, that, EM, uh, that uh, emergency management would like us to open a shelter. And uh, if we need to bring in accessible shower trailers, uh, additional portalettes, um, you know, anything that, that makes the facility accessible and allows people with disabilities to maintain their independence in, in the, the least restrictive setting. So um, that's, that's the main focus of our disability integration team. Thanks, Sherry. It's Mary. And um, I'll just broaden it a little bit um, that our mission is to alleviate suffering for those who have uh, incurred a disaster. Uh, so we provide preparedness education. We provide response, which is sheltering, feeding, disaster health services, mental health and disability integration, as Sherry had outlined. We also have a recovery arm uh, where we provide financial assistance to those who have incurred a disaster. Uh, we have an immediate assistance program shelter transition program and long-term recovery, which is usually a grant type program. And, and that, is, that is what Disaster Cycle Services provides to those individuals who have experienced uh, a disaster. And that's a broader picture. And our mission statement says that we alleviate suffering uh, through volunteers and other methods. And that is what we uh, Red Cross likes to do. Karen? And from the disaster mental health perspective, we look at, we are available to both clients within shelters or the community and the workforce. So that would include our paid staff as well as the volunteers. And we essentially provide enhanced psychological first aid as it's appropriate. We take a look at people's reactions any risk factors, and then we focus on helping them to build their resilience. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, I'll just add from a particularly disaster health services lens, uh, we have licensed healthcare professionals who are volunteers and they assist clients to maintain their optimal health. We assist clients to replace medications, durable medical equipment, consumable medical supplies, and we provide hands-on care as needed because our registered nurses have full scope of practice. Uh, so this assistance can include 
financial assistance, but is not tied to a damage classification. So uh, anyone can have this type of assistance. So Mary, with that, are, are licensed professionals at the shelters when they open? This is Mary, yes. Uh, when, well, not necessarily when they open, but uh, we get them there as quickly as we can. Uh, we have over about uh, 2,500 uh, volunteers in disaster health services, uh, but you know, not everyone deploys nationally. Um, so we depend on regional uh, volunteers also. Uh, but we also, and I know you have some here, personal care attendants, we are very committed to providing assistance with activities of daily living. And uh, sometimes that's hard to stand up immediately. And so our licensed uh, healthcare professionals will assist with activities of daily living. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> When the next question is out kind of the broad spectrum, when does Red Cross provide these services and how does that activate it at the local level when there is a disaster? Well, I can take that. Um, usually emergency management activates the Red Cross and it depends on some previous planning. Of course, we don't want this to be you know, never planned for. So uh, all of our relationships with government, both at the state, local, tribal level, uh, we have government operational volunteers and employees who maintain the uh, relationships with the state, local and tribal governments. And that is how we are activated. However, uh, we didn't talk about what we do 60,000 times a year, and that is our disaster action team response Response, and that is the response to a single and multifamily fires. And that is usually activated by the fire department, uh, usually uh, by calling the local Red Cross uh, region. And then we uh, can assist those single and family fires and the multifamily fires, uh, those survivors of those events. And uh, that's very important work that we do. That's the basis of all our work. Uh, so we do that every day in every part of the country. So Mary, is there any cost to Red Cross services for? Absolutely no cost. Uh, this is, a, a, you know, a, a donor gift uh, to, from the American people uh, to anyone incurring a disaster. Okay, so next question, since we have concurrent disasters going on with COVID-19, as well as natural disasters, what kind of procedures do we have in place to protect from the pandemic? I'll start and then we'll go to some others, Sherry and Karen. Uh, we have really changed many of our um, processes to account uh, for the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have personal protective equipment, uh, we uh, promote social distancing of six feet or more. Uh, and we have changed our congregate shelter set up uh, to accommodate for um, uh, uh, isolation care area. Okay. And then we also want non-congregate sheltering, uh, which is usually in a hotel setting. Uh, however, uh, in this last disaster with Texas, for instance, we had congregate uh, shelters and we provide for much more space around an individual or a household, 110 square feet in a congregate setting during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and, and we uh, try to use non-congregate settings if possible, uh, but that's at the behest usually of state and local government. Okay, thank you for that. So you already kind of touched on how Red Cross is activated at the request of local emergency management or fire department for local fires. Um, how is that information made public? I am I'm gonna take a shot at this one because it's not something that I'm as familiar with as Mary. Mary's, Mary's been around longer than I have and she's kind of my, my brain, my memory. Um, but um, 
the government will uh, make their public announcements about open shelters, um, you know, evacuation orders, that kind of thing. And um, I think one thing that that we, with our focus on disability integration, are trying to do is make certain that that that's communicated in a number of different formats, so that you know everybody has access to that information. Um, and then we have on our website we have a list of shelters. Um, it can you can see it on a map, but you can also choose a list option that that is compatible with a screen reader. And um, so it's it's basically and the other thing that that we do too is is activate our relationships with community partners. Um, I know that I've worked very closely with some. Uh, organizations for people who are deaf or hard of hearing to to get information out to do um, little short videos you know explaining where shelters are we did that um, we did it during Harvey it was probably the first time that I remember us doing specific videos telling people which counties um, had been declared disaster you know with death, disaster declarations and um, and communicating where shelters were so we're i think that's kind of a continuous improvement thing for us we continue to look for ways to to make certain that everybody has access to information okay so in thinking about the preparedness piece who i mean obviously they don't um, there's not going to be shelters set up in blue sky times when there's not a disaster going on so if preparing what kind of contact list and should, should somebody make in the event they lose you know power or you know what would you say to prepare for that side of it well i think um i think the main thing is you know knowing your network knowing how to contact your power company um being on their list if you are reliant upon power for equipment um you know life-sustaining equipment especially um and, and being certain that you have a way to notify them that, you know, you, you're not going to be able to stay at home for long before the power situation is going to affect you. So, um, and then too, and this is a, something that Mary and I continually educate on is that we can support usually um, about 99% of the population of people with disabilities, even people on a ventilator, um, you know, there's, there's not a a push to um, send people to in some, some states, and I don't know that Texas still does this, but you know, special medical needs shelters and that kind of thing. We can support them just fine in a Red Cross shelter, and and that's a that's a group effort. You know, it's it's um, it's disaster health services, it's disaster mental health, it's DI, it's our sheltering folks, it's everybody understanding um, just how to how to assist and how to support people who have some additional needs. So um, I think uh, that contact list we have, uh, and I think we sent you some, some resources, but we have some uh, materials, preparedness materials for people with disabilities and, you know, get a kit, um, make a list, be sure that your, your um, trusted neighbors, as Mary likes to call them, are on your list of people that you call and that you have people who can assist you if necessary um, to help you evacuate if you need to. Um, I think we all know there are some challenges with transportation um, within our communities for, for people who either don't have a car or need, you know, a, a, a paratransit type of assistance. Thank you. Uh, Karen, I have a question for you. So as far as disaster mental health services, is that available outside of a shelter not being set up or is that when a disaster is activated? If you could talk about how that comes into play in the process. So with disaster mental health, we do have licensed social workers, psychologists, marriage and family therapists. We also, and I'm sure there are high school counselors and some others. And we also have parameters by which retirees who at the time of their retirement had a license in good standing can also be disaster mental health volunteers. And these volunteers are available 
regionally, for example, as Mary mentioned, for responses to single and multifamily fires, we have disaster mental health workers on call and they can be available often in COVID, it's mostly virtual at this point, but they are available depending upon the needs of the disaster response, either virtually or on the ground to both assist shelter clients, as I mentioned, the workforce, but also if there are individuals in need with the within the community, I'm sorry, we are available to them as well. Great, so that kind of goes into my next question and, and how does, and, and Sherry's already talked about this, Red Cross develop inclusive practices, not only for individuals with disabilities, but limited English speakers. Um, and how, how are those services provided when a shelter's actually stood up? I can take that one. Um, as far as um, non-English interpretation, we have a contract with uh, Language Line and they provide us with, I believe it's over 70 different languages that we have access to. And we use that in DAD as well. Um, when we have someone who's been affected by a home fire, multifamily fire, who does not, is not comfortable communicating in English, we're able to um, just, it's a quick dial up, punch in a number and we have access to an interpreter. So we also work very closely with Sorensen and uh, we have their InTouch app on computers that are set up in our shelters to um, allow people access to uh, video relay services so that they can stay in touch with their, their families, friends, other people in their network who are not in the shelter and also with you know, services and things that they need access to. Um, we are working with them to develop a disaster response um, video remote interpreting setup so that we have essentially the same thing that we do for non-English um, language interpretation. We, we have access to that as it is, but we, we don't have a formalized um, arrangement with them. So we're working toward that with Sorensen, um, mainly because it Sorensen as opposed to anybody else, because they are the largest provider of um, sign language interpreters on a, on a national level and have access to so many um, interpreters. Uh, they allow their interpreters to volunteer with Red Cross. And so if we have a volunteer who is deployed and is deaf or hard of hearing, needs a sign language interpreter, we have volunteer interpreters who will go with them and accompany them for the entire time that they're deployed. So, um, and one other just quick kind of plug, we, um, a lot of our volunteers who are deaf have been bringing the, um, the masks with the clear openings for lip reading. And um, that has really been helpful, especially, you know, we maintain six feet of distance. We can't give people a hug like we're accustomed to. We can't put an arm around the shoulder. So it really helps for people to be able to see our faces and see our expressions and, and see the compassion and, and kindness behind the, behind the mask. So, um, but that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. We, um, we have other organizations occasionally that will say, um, hey, I have you know, a team of six volunteer interpreters ready to go. Where do you want me to send them? Um, and those usually come from our Centers for Independent Living. All right, uh, the next part, let's see. So how do shelters provide food accommodations for somebody that might have restrictions, dietary restrictions? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, what we have developed is um, we have uh, taken on the model of CMIST that was developed by June Kales out of California. Um, it's communication, maintaining health, uh, independence, uh, safety, security, and self-determination and transportation. Uh, we have added a uh, housing, a uh, pre-disaster housing along with that. Uh, and we do a CMIST interview of the uh, household uh, to assist the household to understand what their needs might be. And if we hit, find that uh, one of the household needs a unique diet, um, then we procure that. We, we might go to a local hospital 
for instance, because they have all special diets and we can maybe get a procure a special meals that way. We've, we've gone uh, to other providers, caterers, et cetera. Um, and we provide that kind of um, meal. We've uh, one story is we simply got a blender for a household because they needed a soft diet. And um, that's how we did that. Um, but the CMIST interview is very important to really assist the client to identify their needs. Because most clients, when they come to a shelter, they're just happy to be safe. And they don't really know what their needs are, maybe not even for two or three days till they figure out Johnny didn't put his inhaler in his backpack. Um, so we try to do this interview so, so that they can think about what their needs might be. Yeah. And Karen, I'm going to have you tag along that. So if an individual needs mental and behavioral health support, what kind of things could Red Cross provide within those, whether it's a congregate setting or even non-congregate at this point? Sure. Often what we see would be the initial reaction to what they've been through. So you might see some level of tears, anxiety, you know, perhaps anger or frustration. What generally happens is those who have, for example, not brought their necessary psychotropic medications, that's not something we may notice right away, but that we might see that over time. And so health services and disaster mental health do share financial resources that can be used for medication replacement for those who need that sort of thing. Um, we also, if, if they've been working with a community mental health provider, our first step would be to try to relink them to those services so that they have the necessary continuity of care and comfort level that's super important after a disaster. And then if that's not available to them, we do as the regional disaster mental health volunteers maintain resource lists. So we have an idea of the resources within the community. So it's about linking people to the services that they've been getting and are comfortable with. Okay. So then I guess the question is, if individuals come to the shelters and for whatever reason, these services aren't readily apparent available, how does an individual request or find out who to talk to to get these services, whether it's accessibility or a dietary thing or the mental health aspect? Is there one person that they should go to in the shelter or? I can take that. Well, our, our workforce, the most important thing is that they're communicating with one another. So disaster mental health would perhaps in a congregate shelter be, if we're on the ground walking around, if not having a list of the clients in the shelter and their contact information and just reaching out and checking in with people and seeing how they're doing. The other piece of it is with the shelter workers, they communicate with disaster health services, with disaster mental health, with disability integration, and with our other functions, just to see if there's a person or a group of people who have particular needs and then contacts within disaster mental health, health services, disability integration, and others are available to the workforce so it could be, you know, a face-to-face -face referral or it could be a phone call or a text. So you're saying when people come in, the ones that they're actually communicating with, interacting with, are gonna be able to say, hey, this is who I need to figure out to put you in touch with. Yes, and the other piece is people have the right to self-determination. So the offer can be made, would you like to speak to someone about what you're going through? And it's up to the client to decide if they're ready to do that at that time and who they'd like to speak with. Gotcha. Mary? I was just gonna add, I was just gonna add that um, in general, we have a shelter site manager, um, even in a non-congregate setting. And certainly, um, and this is an important learning that we've found is that um, 
the clients need to self-advocate uh, for some of these resources. And I think that that is little uh, communicated uh, to communities that, you know, if you need something, say something, um, and we'll do our very best to get the resources and staff that you need. And, but sometimes it's just, well, I'll, I'll just sit here on, on my cot or I'll just stay in the lobby and someone will come along, but you really have to advocate for yourself. Um, you know, we had a, 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 I think he was a, a deaf gentleman, wasn't he, Sherry? And he sat in the lobby and he just waited to hear what his next steps were going to be. This was after Hurricane War. And, and finally someone sat down near him and said, what can I help you with or, or some other way of communicating with them. And so we really encourage people as they are preparing for disasters, if they're in a high threat state, to please understand that we, we can only help you if we know what we need to do to help you. Um, so please speak up, that's very important. Uh, I also wanna point out that um, if you have a kit uh, you need to have a list of your medications. That's very important. Who your um, healthcare providers are. Uh, charging cables, extremely important. Uh, if you have an electric wheelchair, do you have an extra battery? I know that that's difficult and cumbersome, but that that is something that you need to think about uh, bringing along. And again, I'll just emphasize the trusted neighbor approach to your support system. Uh, you'll need to know how to evacuate if you have to evacuate your home. And it may be not through government um, people. It might be that trusted source. So that's all. If I can, <clears throat> I want to um, just kind of elaborate a little on the story Mary was talking about. This uh, gentleman was all by himself and he would sit in the lobby and it was, it, he sat there the first day he was in the shelter and um, one of our DHS nurses was really just trying to find a way to communicate with him. Writing on paper wasn't working and um, I think she was new so she wasn't quite aware that, you know, she, she might could tap into VRS or VRI and and communicate that way, but um, she found an app with stick figures and and a way to kind of point and click. And she finally figured out that all he wanted to know was if he was going to be allowed to stay in the shelter um, and for how long. And so between her and our disability integration uh, worker, they got together, they went over to FEMA's ODIC folks and um, got an interpreter and he didn't, he'd lost his cell phone. And we knew that he had uh, friends who were trying to communicate with him. And so we, they went to the local cell store, you know, I'm not sure which one they went to, it doesn't matter, but um, they got him a phone and uh, got him back in touch with his friends and he disappeared that afternoon and someone I think wanted to kind of talk to him about how we had worked together with him to resolve the issue. And he had gone upstairs and gone to sleep. He had been <laughs> waiting for that news. And once he, he said, once I knew that I was fine here until I could make other arrangements, I was able to get a good night's sleep. So it, it really is important that people understand that, you know, if we haven't asked you, please don't hesitate to tell us if you have a need and, and let us know how we can help you because that's, that's why we're there. It's, you know, it's what we do. Right. And I can jump in too. One of the phrases that we um, really, really believe in is getting to yes on behalf of the clients. So as Sherry said, and as Mary has said, once we know what they need, we do our best to meet that need. Perfect. So this is kind of a good way to wrap up. We are going to provide resources and links at, our, at the end of this um, session. But, you know, this is about building resiliency and resiliency comes back to preparedness and planning. So from each one of you, what is the most important thing someone could do to prepare and plan for disasters? Mary, you want to start? Yes, it's Mary. I, I think having that support system 
the trusted support system that you can depend on that isn't governmental. Um, I think that's a, the most important thing for this uh, community. Jerry? So in addition to that, because I agree, that's, that's probably top, the, the top priority. Um, being aware of what you'll need, um, you, knowing that you don't have to stockpile medications, but throw your medications into a bag, know what, where you're going to go with those as you're preparing to evacuate. Um, one of the happiest days of my life was at a multifamily fire shelter in Charleston, South Carolina, where I lived at the time. And I watched as all of the people who came from this apartment complex walked by and they were all um, older people, people with disabilities, and every one of them had some kind of a bag with their medications in it. And that's, that's just such a, uh, it's a small piece, but it's a huge piece and, and being able to have those meds because sometimes pharmacies are closed. Sometimes, you know, it's difficult to replace those medications if you forget them. So we do it, we do it every day, but um, that and things you need, um, you know, we have sensory kits for um, autistic children and adults and um, but if you have your own and you have certain things that make you more comfortable, help you deal with that sort of chaotic environment of a shelter, you know, please try to remember to bring it with you. Assistive communication devices, just, it's so important to have a list of those things that help you through, throughout the day and, and trying to remember to bring them with you and chargers and all those things. And a list is the best thing you can do. Just make that list and then follow it. Karen? And beyond what Mary and Sherry have mentioned, I think the other thing from a mental health perspective is that it's important for the clients to recognize that they do have strengths, that they can get through whatever they're going through. And that sometimes, and I'm sorry, I have a dog barking, of course, and that sometimes they just need to be helped to recognize how they've gotten through adversity in the past and figure out the small steps they need to take to go forward rather than looking at it as an absolutely overwhelming situation. Small steps. Perfect. Uh, as I had said a little bit ago, we will post um, some resources and links to those resources when we stop this video. But ladies, I want to thank you for the work that you do. And I know it's crazy. That's the world we live in. But um, y'all are definitely, definitely people to know. So, and to go to when we need help. So thank you. And thank you for doing this with me as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for the opportunity.